time that we started talking about well before pandemic. And this was something that we thought would be interesting, engaging, that was something that people had questions about that we wanted to provide a resource that we felt was going to be really helpful. And we had amazing partners who stood up and stepped up and helped us uh, create this program and outreach with this program. So it was all of this big process. We were ready to go. It was going to happen. I think, I think Simone, am I right? It was like April 4th last year was our plan for this, this program. I think it was like 11 months ago, we, we had this beautiful dis design all set up. And then as we started thinking 11 months ago, what people were up against and that idea of trying to slam people in that moment and say, you guys are trying to figure out how to make sure your kids are just in school via virtual stuff. Let's not, let's not like rock the boat too much. So we're really happy that even though we're still not back to an equilibrium, I think 11 months ago, if we had imagined that 11 months later on March 4th, we would still be in this same kind of universe, we would be surprised by it we're at least more prepared to have these conversations. And if anything, there is so much more reason to have these kinds of important and challenging conversations. This is not something in the past year that has gone away. And if anything, it's become more important to be able to engage our kids um, in these difficult discussions. So while um, our lecturer tonight, our Dr. Simone Schweber is going to give a kind of framework for addressing the Holocaust, this really does provide a broader framework for all of the many challenges that we have in explaining the world in which we live to our children. So I wanna do the kind of, you know, if I were in an airplane, this would be the part where I tell you to fasten your seatbelts, um, but please be patient with us. We are trying out some new techniques tonight to make this particularly interactive and engaging. Um, if there are technical glitches, please reach out to either me, Ellie Gettinger, or Jewish Museum Milwaukee on here, and we will try and respond in as quickly as we can. Let us know if you can't hear, if you're having trouble seeing any of those sorts of things. Um, but we're doing our best to make sure that this is the best possible experience for you. Um, I would also recommend having this in speaker view and not gallery view. Although if you're somebody who really likes to see how other people are responding, feel free to keep it in gallery view, you do you. Um, but if you really wanna engage with uh, Dr. Schweber on her and what she's saying, I would suggest that that is the way to go. Um, and I want to take an opportunity to thank our tremendous sponsors for this program. We have really, we've had lovely people step up to make sure that this was a free program, that it's accessible, that it's uh, engaging lots of audiences. So we've got to thank Sharon and Richard Cantor, uh, Karen E. and Leonard Loeb, Donor Advised Fund of the Milwaukee Jewish Federation, the Nathan and Esther Peltz Holocaust Education Resource Center, who engages all sorts of different levels with Holocaust education throughout the state of Wisconsin. They're in the process of working on a Holocaust mandate right now. If you have questions about that, my colleague Samantha Abramson is on this chat and you can direct message her or she's going to throw her email in chat for you right now. And she's gonna hate me later, but I love you, Sam. Um, and uh, then we also have some great programming partners on this. The Coalition for Jewish Learning is here and they do so much in, about engaging uh, educators throughout our Jewish community. And so we really appreciate their attendance and sponsorship. Um, and also the Milwaukee Jewish Day School and the Milwaukee Public Library. So there are all sorts of different ways in which people heard about this program. Um, and I see that Joanne is asking, will this be available for viewing afterwards to those who cannot attend? Yes, it will. We will be sending out the link to everyone who pre-registered. It will also be up on our YouTube page afterwards. So, um, feel free to share that broadly. We, you know, if the optics on that, if that's one of those things that goes viral, I don't think Simone or I mind, right? Like if suddenly there's like, look at all these parents really engaging with Holocaust education. Yes, that's a win for all of us. It is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Simone Schweber. Dr. Schweber was actually the first person who brought a group into Jewish Museum Milwaukee. I don't know if you know that. Um, so I have this great affection for her and everything that she does. It's been a pleasure to work with her on this program. She is the Judith B. and Michael S. Goodman Chair of Education and Jewish Studies at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. She specializes in teaching and learning about the Holocaust and genocide. And she has so many different books and articles and programs that she's worked on that it's like exhaustive. So I'm going to turn it over to her and let you kind of 
get a sense of, of this workshop today. And we are so excited that you're all here. Please use chat as you already are throwing things in here. That's lovely. Do that. Um, let us know where you're from, how you heard about us, any of those sorts of things. We're excited to interact with you and to make this a real workshop, not a frontal lecture. So enjoy and thank you. So friends, I'm just about to share my screen. Um, and so you should be able to see it. Can you see my screen now? Okay, great. Um, so first of all, I just want to say thank you. Um, uh, here, first, thank you. Really thank you both to the organizers. I'm actually really grateful for the opportunity to meet. Um, but also thank you to all of you for showing up because um, I think uh, I, I personally understand the desire to spend a Thursday night in bed um, you know, exhausted from just getting through the day. So, um, and in fact, if it weren't for this, I, I would be drinking wine alone in my house with my pandemic puppy. So, um, so I am very, very glad to be here and I'm really happy to meet you. And if you hear some barking or scratching at the door, it's because I'm a terrible dog trainer and have not trained my puppy to be alone in the world yet. So, um, so that's my apology and, um, and really, I'll tell you what I have planned uh, and I'm, I'm open to being flexible. Oh, but before I tell you what I have planned, uh, I'm gonna start with a land acknowledgement. Uh, my home where I'm talking to you from uh, occupies ancestral Ho-Chunk land uh, and um, as does the University of Wisconsin-Madison where I'm a professor. So I'm gonna start by just acknowledging um, the land that I'm on uh, and that my home is on. In an 1832 treaty, the Ho-Chunk were forced to give up this land. Decades of ethnic cleansing followed where both the federal and state governments repeatedly but unsuccessfully tried to forcibly remove the Ho-Chunk from Wisconsin, their ancestral lands. This history of colonization and exploitation, this history of state sanctioned violence and racism, this is the history of my university, of my city, of my state and our country. So today, institutions like the UW-Madison respect the inherent sovereignty of the Ho-Chunk Nation, which has been called de Jope from time immemorial, along with the other First Nations of Wisconsin. Um, so in this land acknowledgement, I just wanna say, I wanna, I wanna make sure that we recognize that respecting history and sovereignty isn't a symbolic act alone. Colonialism is a process that continues and this land acknowledgement is just a very small part of the ongoing work that we need to do to keep decolonizing our traditions, to reshape our institutions, um, and to radically alter not only our relationships with each other as immigrants and First Nations people, but also our relationships to these lands, um, to our economic, social, and governance systems overall. So, um, uh, so just as a side note, oh, look at that. Oh no, my, my, um, oh, okay. That's how I'm going to progress my slides. Just as a side note, if you want some great resources uh, to follow up on First Nations of Wisconsin, th this is a great website to start with, wisconsinfirstnations.org. There are great teaching resources. They're great just resources to learn more about um, First Nations of Wisconsin. Um, okay. So my goals for tonight are, um, are the following. I, and I'll tell you right out of the gate what I think the answer to the big questions are. Um, but my big goals are for us, us to share our collective wisdom and our, extend our communal lives beyond our bubbles right now. Um, I don't know about you, but I, I found this pandemic world very socially isolating. So I was excited about the idea of having small group discussions. I hope you are too. Please don't disappear when we break you out into groups to discuss. Um, so my hope is that we'll learn something from each other that broadens or sharpens our thinking, maybe gain a little comfort and practice in talking to our own kids um, or thinking about how we wanna talk to our own kids or others' kids uh, and get some fabulous resources or even just one. Um, so I hope those are good goals. I don't have other good goals. Um, and basically, I've designed the evening to have four big parts. The first part is where we'll be talking in small groups and investigating the controversy. The second part, um, I'm going to present to you a little bit of research that's my research on schooling about the Holocaust. Uh, and I'm going to think, I'm going to share with you ways of thinking about what to do with our own kids uh, through that research. And then, if you're up for it, um, and if there's time, uh, we could. 
I thought it might be useful. Sometimes it's helpful to just practice what we want to say. We don't get a lot of chance. Uh, we don't get a lot of chances to practice what we want to say with our own kids. When I'm training teachers, we give teachers a lot of practice if they're in traditional training programs. Um, but parents, we don't often have that practice. Usually our kids ask us something and we're just kind of winging it because that's the beauty of parenting. So if I figured if you're here and you're really trying to figure out how to talk to young kids about the Holocaust, your young kids presumably, um, it might be fun to just try it out and see what you think. Um, and then I have some great resources. I actually, um, I, have, I have a great resource for you to share. So, and I'll take questions if you have questions. So, so that's the shape of the evening um, and I'm looking forward to it. And really, again, I'm just happy you're here. Uh, so to start off with though, I'm gonna ask you to group yourselves. And, um, and, here, and I want you to do it in a particular way. And I'll, I'll tell you how I want you to do it because I'm a little bit of a, a micromanager. Um, or as my children would tell you, I'm a lot of a micromanager. Uh, but okay, here's what I want you to think about. I want you to, um, under your participant button on Zoom, you can click, uh, you should be able to click on participants and find your name, and you should be able to rename yourself. If you look at the, there should be a little um, area that says more, and if you click on that, you should be able to rename yourself. And here's how I want you to rename yourself. I want you to imagine that there's a continuum from A to D um, shown here in this slide. And the A, if you're gonna put an A before your name, it's because you're a high talker. And what I mean by that is that you're somebody who likes to talk, who likes to jump, jump into a conversation, isn't afraid of an argument, likes that exchange of ideas. And if you're on the other side of the continuum, if you're a D, uh, you're a high listener, which means you're somebody who really likes to listen before you speak. You really like to process and think about what you hear. And if you're somewhere in between, you're somewhere in between. So if, I want you to put an A before your name if you think of yourself as a high talker. I want you to put a B in front of your name if you think of yourself as a moderately high talker. So you lean more towards high talk than high listening, but you, you listen too. Um, if, I want you to put a C in front of your name if you're a moderately high listener and a D in front of your name if you are a high listener. And just to be very clear, there is no shame anywhere on this continuum. There is no place of guilt or pride. We're all different uh, and it's not a big deal. But go ahead and do that because um, what we're going to do is put you in groups by your comfort level with talk. And I'll tell you why I'm doing that. I'm doing that because high talkers, when they're together, will push each other in the conversation and we'll all be high talkers and high listeners will fill up the space that they take up listening. So it's just a nice way to group people. But the truth of the matter is, if you don't do it, we're still going to put you in a group. So don't worry. Um, and now, because I'm a micromanager of, of what I want people to do, I'm going to tell you what you're going to do in this small group. In your small group, which if you're two people on the screen, that's wonderful. Don't worry, we're gonna count you as one or you can be your own people. Doesn't matter at all. It's, it doesn't matter if you're in groups of four or five or doesn't matter. But roughly in your small group, I want a few of you to be yeses and a few of you to be noes. So if you're in a group of four, I want two of you to be yeses and two of you to be noes. And I want you to hold on to that position and speak from that position. If we were in a classroom, and we're not, thankfully, all of us, if we were in a classroom, I would give you a lot of structure, but you're all adults. So, so I just want your, the people who are yeses, give us some good reasons for yes, and I'll give you the prompt next. And then noes, I want you to give you some good reasons for your assigned position as noes. Um, and you can ask each other questions, but your aim is to generate light, not heat. So you're not fighting, you're not arguing, this isn't a debate. You're aiming to ask authentic questions. And then when you get a blast from this, from um, on Zoom, you'll see about eight minutes in, I want you to switch positions. So the yes is your no's and the no's your yeses. And I want you to do the same thing. So I hope that makes sense. Here's the question that I want you to focus on together. Um, oh, and by the way, feel free to add um, questions or comments uh, in your chat function or hold on to them. Because if you put them in the chat in your small group, they'll only show up for your small group. But hold on to any big questions you come up with. Uh, feel free to put them in the chat when you come back. 
And here's the question I want you to address in your small group that your yeses and noes and then noes and yeses. Should young kids learn about the Holocaust now? And by now, I know we're living through this together, but I just wanna make clear what I mean by now. I think we're not only living through the pandemic of the coronavirus, which is raising anxieties, but we're also living through a moment of uh, grappling as a country with white supremacy and the rise of white supremacy. We're living with uh, and through a giant global economic contraction that we don't know what it's gonna look like. And we're living through um, a moment of heightened awareness and heightened attention and a desperate need to attend to global climate change. So those are real um, uh, contexts to think about um, should young kids learn about the Holocaust now? And I know I set that up as though to say no, but I don't mean no. The reason I have you in group, the reason I want you to sort of engage this is because I think I think there's many good reasons to say yes, as there are to say no now. And, um, and there's no one right easy answer. Uh, it's what makes this an interesting question. Uh, Simone, as we're going into this, there is a question on defining what you think of as young. Ah, that's such a great question. So I think of young personally um, as anybody before about eight or nine years old. The truth is I think of young as, as uh, higher than that too, in terms of age. Um, because of course you can have kids whose age, you know, we can have older kids whose emotional maturity is, they're just young for their age or, or they've w lived wonderfully sheltered lives or they're just, um, so it doesn't really matter. The truth is young is, is who you're thinking of. Do you think young kids should learn about the Holocaust now is what are the young kids you have in mind? Uh, but if you want to, if you want to range, I would go up for up, up to anything like up to third grade, roughly third grade in the US, eight, eight nine years old um, or higher, 10th grade, doesn't matter. I mean, 10 years old, fourth grade. Does that make sense, friends? Okay, you ready? You're about to be flown through the ether um, or the Zoom land or, you know, the internet wires. Uh, and if you have a slow connection, don't worry. Zoom will, it, it just might take a moment, but you should get a Zoom invitation to get into groups. Um, and, and just enjoy it and meet each other and talk and we'll come back together and talk together. So hi friends, I hope you can hear me. Um, and I know sometimes it takes a minute for people to get back into the main room once they were in a breakout group. Um, so I'll just, I'll talk for a moment while people are coming back and just say, I hope you had a great conversation um, and, and enjoyed meeting people. Uh, I have, um, so uh, here's the next, oh, I was supposed to ask if there were any questions before I put you in, we put you in rooms, but it's too late for that. Um, I do wanna remind you if, if some really interesting questions came up in your discussions, um, feel free to put them in the chat now. It's not rude in any way. Um, and Ellie will um, collect them. I can't see the chat while I'm presenting to you, um, but I'll, we'll have a chance to talk about questions uh, a little bit later. So this next part, we're into section two of this presentation. And what I wanna do here is just um, give you a little bit of an overview of some research on the controversy that you just discussed. Uh, and it's research I did. And it's kind of old research is the truth. It wasn't conducted during a pandemic. It was a decidedly different moment. Um, and it's research I did uh, on, in a school, not in a home. Um, and so in some ways it has relevance to what we're gonna talk about. And in some ways it's, it's pretty different. Uh, but, um, but the research was prompted by the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. Uh, they were trying to come up with age um, recommendations for how old kids should be to view the, um, uh, the main exhibit. And there, at the time, there, was a lot, there were lots of people who had written opinions, and there wasn't a lot of empirical research about, um, about uh, what it's like when kids learn about the Holocaust in detail when they're young and what happens to them. So I'm gonna just present two studies pretty quickly. Um, and I, I talk quickly. So um, if I'm talking too quickly, please uh, put something in the chat and Ellie will interrupt and tell me to go slower. Um, but I'll tell you, I got interested in this. I, I'm, I've been interested in Holocaust education for a long time. 
And I think of this thing called curricular creep, which I call curricular creep, which just means that when a subject is, is powerfully important to teachers, what we can often see is that when it, it starts out in the high school level, it moves to middle school, it moves down to elementary school, sometimes it moves down even to the lower grades, pre-K. Um, and so I think of that as a kind of curricular creep and it's, there's nothing wrong with it. it. It comes from teachers' great intentions of wanting to cover important material things that they think matter um, with young kids if they're teaching young kids. Um, so, so there, um, there are currently loads of picture books, really great ones for teaching uh, about the Holocaust to young kids, for introducing them to the ideas. Um, and I wanted to do some research on um, what happens when young kids learn about it in a formal way. So there were a bunch of um, studies saying that there were children's books about it. There were films for young people. Um, there were a lot of professional development opportunities that people were asking that were designed for secondary school teachers and that elementary and middle school teachers were asking um, to take part in. Uh, and there were lots of academic debates. There's still academic debates about um, how traumatizing uh, difficult material is or um, uh, can you get what's called secondary trauma, which is to say, so when you don't experience trauma yourself, but you read about it or learn about it and you're somebody who's sensitive and identifies what happens. So there are a lot of different folks, educational philosophers who argue for, like Jerome Bruner, who says, look, there's an appropriate version of any skill or knowledge that can be taught to any age, um, no matter how preparatory the version has to be. Um, or Karen Sean wrote that, look, because children lost their innocence during the Holocaust doesn't mean that our children should lose theirs by learning about the Holocaust when they're too early, too young for it. Um, a, a, one of the people who worked at the Holocaust Museum said this to me when I was doing this research, here's an implication of the Holocaust that adults don't protect innocent children. And that's a major reason why you don't teach this to young kids. Um, and there are people who have argued for a long time that it's very important to teach young kids the truth, the truth, the truth, because that's how we build them into um, young people who understand, even if they don't understand at all, it's something that they can build on later. So I did, so, oh, here's what I'm gonna to talk to you about next. Um, a lot of the folks who used to argue for, um, for why you should teach about kids at a young age about the Holocaust said things like this, and they're probably things that came up in your conversations. Look, in some, it's, it's already happening. We know that young kids learn about the Holocaust when they see it on TV, when they see it in South Park, if they have older siblings, if they learn about it in this haphazard way. So wouldn't it be better for teachers in schools who are trained to do it, to teach about the Holocaust and teach it in ways that are sensitive and appropriate? In some states, it's already mandated. So in, uh, excuse me, in New Jersey and Florida as examples, there are K-12 mandates to teach about the Holocaust which is to say that kindergartners are supposed to learn about the Holocaust in New Jersey. It's mandated um, content uh, and it scaffolds their future understandings. We know that through the Holocaust, you can learn amazing things, um, uh, reduce prejudice, understand racism uh, and childhood shouldn't be an innocent time. And some of those arguments coalesce around this idea that the Holocaust is universal and it's universally important. It has universal lessons to teach so why not teach about it in a young age? And then there were folks that argue against that, claiming that, look, the subject matter is too complex unless you're gonna teach something called pre-Holocaust education, which isn't really about the Holocaust, it's really about prejudice or racism generally or anti-Semitism. Simone, go to your next slide. Um, okay. Uh, this one? I, I'm just guessing your next slide, if it's arguments pro, that the next one is arguments against. Yes. Yeah, um, so we just, so this was arguments pro and this, are you not seeing, this is arguments against. Are you seeing that? We're seeing arguments pro. Oh, look at that. I'm seeing arguments against. It might just, sometimes it just takes it a while to, to get to the rest of the universe, but if not, you might have to unshare and reshare. Um, so I'm just going to unshare and reshare. Okay. How about now, now? Are you seeing arguments against? Yay. Thank you for your patience. All right, so the people who argue against it say basically, look, the subject matter is too complex for young folks. They don't, their developing minds don't understand it cognitively. Emotionally, it can do damage. Um, and really what you would teach to young kids is pre-Holocaust education anyway. 
And so sometimes those kinds of arguments constellate around this idea that the Holocaust is unique in history um, and should be treated at, um, um, more gently uh, in a kind of special way. So I did this research project that said, I'm gonna look for somebody who's teaching about the Holocaust in a, in a way that isn't um, pre-Holocaust education um, and I want to look at it. I want to look at it in the early grades. I want somebody who's a really good teacher, and I want to see what kids understand cognitively and what psychological impact it has. Are you seeing the next slide too? Yes, great. All right. So I found a fabulous teacher who had been teaching for a long time. I sat in on all the classes. I um, interviewed the kids. I interviewed their parents. I interviewed the teacher, um, and. Um, and I did this study of this class. And I will just tell you, the teacher was amazing, an amazing teacher, well-loved in the community, um, uh, really dedicated to, teach to teaching this material, um, had been teaching for a long time, was very comfortable. And he said, look, I wanna shake up their world a little bit when I asked him why he wants to teach about the Holocaust. He says, I don't wanna scare the heck out of them or anything like that, but I want them to learn that it's not a fair world here. There's a lot of unfairness. So he taught about the Holocaust in a third grade classroom. And the way he taught about it was through kids lit. And in the beginning, he taught this book called The Terrible Things, um, which is based on that Martin Niemöller quotation about first they came for the trade unionists and I wasn't a trade unionist, so I didn't speak up. And he inverted the storyline with the kids. He said, they read this whole story about how the terrible things keep coming and taking away different animal groups. And then in class, he had the kids invert it. He said, like, what should you do to resist when something terrible happens? Um, and the kids came up with these great ideas, like what would animal resistance groups look like? And the frogs could hurl lily pads and the porcupines could take out their um, uh, quills and the rabbits could cause allergic reactions. Um, and we can do the same thing with our kids at home reading books. Sometimes if they get scary, we can invert them and say, what is it we want to do with this information? He went on to read um, another book that got a little bit more deeply into the Holocaust, Helen and Lydia. Um, and he was really masterful at something that I want to highly recommend, which is he was really masterful at not telling, but just evoking, figuring out what it is kids had heard, what it is they knew and trying to figure out what they understood of that. I'm somebody who's a high talker. So I'm somebody who typically likes to tell and I don't always make room to just hear. And one of the things that we high talkers can do, can learn from high listeners is just to remember to listen and to open up the space to ask. So this teacher, for example, asked his class, you know, why do you think Lydia's mother sewed the Star of David on her jacket? And the kids who were third graders, offered all these answers like, well, I think they were proud of, of, of being Jewish. So that's why they would put on Jewish stars. There was one Jewish girl in the class. I'm speeding up a little bit because I don't want to keep you um, too long. There was one Jewish girl in the class. And a lot of what I'm going to say ends up focusing on her because she was a Jewish girl. Um, Lila was the one Jewish kid when, um, when the other kids in the class were saying like, well, maybe they were proud, like the way we wear a cross. Lila said like, Hitler didn't like Jewish people, so he would make them put these stars on them so he could tell which ones were Jewish and take them to concentration camps. And the teacher was like, okay, slow down, um, hold on there, hold your thoughts there. And Lila can't restrain herself. And she says to the class, like, I'm Jewish and I'm, it wasn't, she was, she was trying to say, look, people didn't have to wear Jewish stars because I'm Jewish and I'm proud of it. Some people here, and she means the kids in the class have not heard about this, that Hitler didn't like the Jewish people. So, um, so the kids had actually heard of what concentration camps were, but they didn't have the concept of what concentration camps were, right? Like they've just heard the term. And in fact, as a side note, one of the kids in the class um, had recently been diagnosed as having ADHD. And she thought concentration camps might mean someplace that she would have to be sent to learn how to concentrate. So there are all kinds of ways in which kids when we don't, when they don't have the concepts that we're dealing with, they make things up, right? They fill in those gaps. Lila, the one Jewish girl in the class, um, she really identified 
with learning about the Holocaust because she's a Jewish kid. So she felt herself often implied in the stories in ways that the other third grade kids did not. Um, so, so for example, in the story Lydia and Helen, um, Lila wrote in her, uh, they had an assignment to write letters to the character who gets um, taken away. And Lila wrote in her letter, Dear Lydia, I'm so sorry I was mean to you. You're still my best friend, at least I hope so. Someone else lives in your house now. Do you still like me? Please write me back. I hope those people did not hurt you. There was no reason to. You, along with all those people, did not commit a crime. So this teacher very masterfully takes the kids through harder and harder books. And they and some of the kids, like when they're learning about hiding, they like this trap door part. Or I like secret places. I like secret stuff. So I like that part when, they, um, when I asked in interviews, like, what, so which book do you like? How did, what did you think about today? Hildy and Eli is a book about the Holocaust by David Adler. Um, and it's, it, it's the first book that they dealt with that moved the kids into the concentration camp world. Um, and this book is about eight-year-old kids, um, two, one a religious Jew, one a non-religious Jew. Uh, and the kids in the class are eight years old too. Um, and so uh, the teacher um, also ends up talking really in some detail about the death camps um, using this book. Uh, and the kids again are struggling with um, a, lots of different kids in the class from lots of different countries of origin. Um, some kids um, with special needs, um, English language learners. And so they're just trying to figure out the content um, and they're trying to understand what he's telling them when he explains that the Holocaust involves mass murder and shows them images like this one of um, the shoes that were removed from concentration camp inmates. And the kids said things like this, and, I, and I'm not sharing this with you to say like, oh, shame on these kids, not at all. I think this is just how they, uh, they're understanding what they're hearing and, and what sense they make of it. So like when they saw this image, um, one little boy, one young boy said, oh, penny loafers. And another kid said like, whoa, if those were pennies, we would be rich. This book, The Number on My Grandfather's Arm, um, is a very sweet book for very young kids. Um, this teacher very purposefully showed it later, uh, even after the concentration camps, in part because it deals with a grandfather explaining the number on his forearm as having been an Auschwitz survivor to his young grandchild. It doesn't go into great depth, but it uses photographs instead of drawings. Um, and this teacher was very careful to focus on photographs only at this point, because in his mind, he thought photographs would be more real to the kids. It was actually a kind of brilliant move because, um, because this story is sweet and it gave the kids a little bit of a break. And I just want to share with you that Lila, the one Jewish girl, really felt, really took in this information um, about the concentration camps, about, um, uh, about the mass scale. Uh, and she, in an interview with her, she said, you know, I get when I asked, how does this affect her? She said, I get really sad and I just get all depressed and stuff. Hearing about these people who, I mean, if I were born 50 years ago, this could have been me. Uh, we had a second interview where she didn't want to talk anymore and, and started crying. Um, and the end of the unit, um, the teacher said, look, let's, uh, they ha he had them chart, you know, as a class, what do you already know and what would you like to learn? And the kids wanted to know what was the gap, like what was, what did they, um, did Anne Frank, did she get sprayed? So that's what they were thinking the gas chambers are, is getting sprayed. Um, and why do like all Jews usually have black dark hair was another kid's question. And so what you see is that kids are really interpreting this information in really, really different ways. Um, One question, Simone, sure. where geographically was this class? Uh, this was this class. So when you do research on um, living people, you promise not to say where they are. But so, so I'm not allowed to tell you where they are, but what I can tell you is that um, it was a community uh, that was an urban community. It had a large university in it um, and it was in the Midwest. 
Um, so, uh, and it was a diverse school um, and a public school. I should, have, I should have made clear that it was a public school. Um, and so this teacher ended the, the um, unit with a focus on Anne Frank. Um, and it involved a bunch of different storybooks that deal with Anne Frank. There are a lot of storybooks that deal with Anne Frank. This one's an especially beautiful one, um, but it's interesting, you know, one of the, one of the things that um, came up for some of the kids was that they didn't, they thought actually that the really beautiful um, uh, uh, illustrations were actual. So like one of the, one of the girls said, I love her room. It's so colorful. And I thought like, I get, I get where she's getting that image from, but um, that's how she's interpreting what the storybook looked like to her. So, um, so they learned a lot about uh, Anne Frank and unlike a lot of treatments of Anne Frank, they did learn about the last months of Anne Frank's life too. Uh, and so here are some excerpts from class where, um, where the teacher was showed this picture was and they, uh, explaining that they were, sh the women were shaved when they were, when they went to the, um, uh, when they went to Bergen-Belsen um, and one student asked, well, how come they did that shave their heads? Um, and another student said, well, maybe for when they came, they, they looked all shiny, like maybe that was a thing to look good. And so what you see over and over again is that for some kids, the heaviness of the information just sort of flows beyond them, right? Like it just flows over them. And for some kids, it really hits home. The teacher showed this uh, excerpts, not the whole thing, but showed excerpts of this film on Anne Frank, which is actually quite a good adaptation of Anne Frank. It's really well done, um, but I would recommend it for older kids uh, rather than this age. Um, and what you see again is that just that same um, that same tension where where a bunch of the kids in the class when they were watching the film and they saw that the Nazis had German shepherds. Some of the kids asked like, well, how about the dogs? Like, did the dogs get food? Um, or when they saw pictures of people, um, corpses laid on the floor, um, one student asked, you know, well, could they sleep longer? Were they allowed to sleep? Uh, and even when Mr. Frank is returned, is shown in the film, returning to the attic and finding Anne Frank's diary, um, one, one uh, girl asked, well, what about the cat? Like the Anne Frank's cat, what about the cat? Did the cat die? So there's nothing wrong with those attachments to pets. We know young kids are attached to pets and to animals um, uh, and it's how they're making sense and what they care about. Um, but here's what Lila wrote in her journal about the film, uh, which marked the end of the unit. She said, when we watched that movie, I felt horrible, but I can't describe my feelings when people were laughing in the class, they were laughing. They weren't laughing in a rude way. They were laughing because they were just kind of confused. When people were laughing or saying it was sick, which means it was cool, I just got so mad. Someone said, poor rats, because in the movie it shows rats over the bodies. Um, well, think about how much worse it was for the people. Sometimes I just got so scared, mad and sad all at the same time. It's so scary to think how many people were killed. Also, it's hard to believe that some of my relatives could have been in the Holocaust. It's so scary, I don't like to think about it. It seems like when you were in the camps, you were in a lot of pain. Every minute you had something to worry about. It's painful to think about. So here, so the kids, um, they did this unit at the end of the year. So- How long was it? What was yeah, it like so the whole time? unit was almost four weeks. Um, and because it was elementary school, uh, it was a chunk every day. It wasn't. It wasn't like just. It wasn't just a day a week or two days a week. It was every day, um, and they ended the unit at the end of the year. And in celebration of the end of the unit and the end of the year, they went to the zoo. And I will just share with you that Lila, in the bus ride to the zoo, um, didn't. She was sitting apart from her friends, and she felt alone. Um, and so here's, here's some, here's some, my, here's, here are my reflections on that unit. Um, so first of all, I would argue that that, that Holocaust unit they had was not pre-Holocaust education. 
it was as detailed as some middle school treatments I've seen. Um, it was, so you couldn't argue that they, it was, it was watered down. Um, and in terms of student learning, you just had, re you had two really clear groups among the students. Some of the students understood what they were learning and some of them didn't. Uh, and you saw that over and over and over again. Um, and you also saw the cognitive reflected in the cycle in the, in the emotional impact. So, um, so of the kids who got it and who sort of understood what they were learning about, about a fifth of the students had nightmares about um, what they were learning and their parents reported that. Some of the kids also said that, but not all the kids, but their parents did. Their parents said like, yeah, they woke up in the middle of the night, they were afraid. Um, Lila had a real depression according to her parents. And, um, and that meant that she didn't like, she, during that unit, she didn't, she stopped playing with her brother. She stopped playing with her cats. She was sad. She didn't want to play with her friends. Um, and she said this, she said, you know, it just makes me worry so much seeing those dying people. Uh, and and uh, another child who was in this group, who, the group I think of as getting it, said, you know, when I see those concentration camps, I can't stop thinking about it. And then there are those kids who, who kind of didn't get it, and that's fine. It's, there's no judgment on them, obviously, but who wrote things like this or who said things like this in uh, my interviews with them. They said like, oh, well, I think Anne was much prettier before she went to the concentration camps. Like when I asked, you know, what's your impression of what you learned or, um, or this little boy who said, I would like to learn more about the Holocaust. I watched the movie and I'll watch it almost every year until I'm 16, because then I will probably understand it. And that's a beautiful metacognitive move, right? Like that, this kid understands that what they were learning is important, but can't quite figure out what it, what, what that importance is, knows he's missing something. It's, it's, a, it's such a smart um, reflection on what he gets and what he doesn't get. So what I ended up concluding in that study was this, I ended up saying, so, so Mr. Kuknich, the, the teacher whom I really deeply admire, the parents, all the parents I interviewed said, look, they believed it was the right time for their kids to learn about the Holocaust. Even Lila's parents um, uh, said it was absolutely the right time for her to learn about it. Uh, and they said for a whole variety of reasons, they trusted the teacher, um, they thought the occasional nightmare for the right reasons is what you should be learning in school. School isn't a playground, you know, you shouldn't be happy. This is terrible stuff they're learning. Why should they be happy? Uh, and they would much rather have professionals who understand the content teaching them. Um, I ended up coming down slightly differently. I ended up saying, look, uh, I interviewed the kids and asked the whole class, like, do you think you learned about it at the right time in your lives? And most of the kids said, um, well, maybe we were just a little too young. Uh, and I ended up sort of siding with that voice, not because I thought anything was wrong, but just because with that kind of detail, uh, there's, there's room in life, there's room in their lives to do that later. I, it didn't have to be done in that moment uh, in that way. But I, I do think it was done respectfully and kindly. And, um, and I will just tell you that 12 years later, I tried to track down the kids who were in that study. And, um, and because um, where this study was done is a place that has a lot of uh, movement, a lot of parents um, who leave and who are that just there temporarily, uh, the only kid I could track down uh, easily was Lila and she was in color college and I interviewed her about what she remembered about that third grade class and she had remarkably precise memories and said that she had felt very isolated and had felt very lonely because of that unit partly for being in that unit especially because it was at the end of the year and because she felt so different from her friends and their reactions she felt very separate and alone with it and that interestingly enough she had avoided what she called casual contact with the Holocaust ever since. So she had learned about it in high school. Um, you know, she didn't have a choice. But when it, she got to college, she didn't want to take any courses about it. She didn't. She avoided courses that had it in it. And she even found herself. Um, she was in Amsterdam uh, uh, at some point, 
and found herself going to Anne Frank's house um, and felt very alone again in the way that she had in third grade. And what she did say to me is that she's a sensitive human and she knows that about herself. So, so she said, she herself said, you know, it might be that other kids in that class um, wouldn't, it might be that even other Jewish kids wouldn't have been affected the way I was affected, but it did affect her deeply. Um, so that's just kind of interesting, you know, if we have kids who identify closely, um, it's really worth thinking about the way it imprints. Um, so what does that mean for us now? Uh, and what is a school-based study? What can it tell us about learning at home? Um, and I'll just, I'll tell you what I think. The, I'll tell you what I think. We know that Holocaust education, good Holocaust education can do all kinds of things. It can teach kids empathy. It can help teach them critical citizenship, what it means to stand up. It can imbue them with moral courage. Uh, it can orient them towards multicultural inclusion and inclusiveness generally. And simultaneously, there's the moment that we're in and nobody's studied the moment we're in, right? We're in the present. We're in a time of high anxiety where we know that there are increased depression rates among kids. Um, we're seeing just the beginnings of ag agoraphobia among some kids who have been shut in. Um, so they're feeling maybe a little bit, not necessarily full-blown agoraphobia, but a little bit less comfortable in social environments because they haven't been in social environments if they've been home. Um, we're seeing higher rates of suicidality, even among young kids. We know that there's housing insecurity, rising poverty. There are probably higher rates of domestic violence, even though um, it's hard to measure uh, because um, people aren't, re people aren't uh, at liberty as much by, uh, by virtue of being in their homes, they're not as much at liberty to call um, for help easily. We have increases in anti-Semitism, and of course, we have the rise of racist discourses and anti-Black racism in particular. Kids are reporting about being stuck at home if they're not in school, um, boredom, affectlessness, a pandemic malaise. So there are all these reasons that, on the one hand, we're having hard conversations with our kids because we can't escape them. And on the other hand, um, I would say, when we're thinking about should young kids learn about the Holocaust now, you, you are the people who know your kids best. You know best whether your, your kids are, whether your kid in particular is sensitive and in what ways. Have you lost someone to COVID? Is death real to your kid? Um, is death uh, vague? Um, so, so I know I went over a little bit in time um, and, um, and I want to make sure we actually get to the question of how do you talk to young kids about the Holocaust if you want to? Um, and I really truly believe there's no right answer. There's no yes or no. You may have family connections to the Holocaust uh, and it's a beautiful way to be connected to your family to understand it. You may want to do something that's that is Holocaust education but pre-Holocaustal. So in other words focusing not on concentration camps as factories of death but on how we use language uh, because it's always the case that, that violence starts with words. Um, so, so what I wanted to do in just the last few minutes um, was to go over ways to open up versus closing down that discussion. Because even if you have a kid who's really interested in the Holocaust, you may decide that for your own sake and your own anxiety levels, it's not the right time for you to have the conversation. So it's fine to close it down. Or you may decide that it's a good time to open it up because you have the time and space and opening for it. Um, and so it's just worth remembering that discussion, discussions, having these conversations with your kids, discussions involve a skill set. Um, and we may not typically think of it that way, but we can all improve on it in part about, you know, whether you're a high listener or a high talker or in part about knowing what your kids might need in that moment and also being aware that sometimes the information will just wash off them so um so on the one hand you of course want to be careful and and sensitive and on the other hand sometimes kids don't take in what they they can't take in um so a few last points i think um if you want to open up discussion how to do that um 
And if you want to close discussion and how to do that has a lot to do with who you are in the discussion um, and, uh, and what resources you have. And it's always okay to say, let's figure that out together. Or, or you know what, this is a great, you're asking a great question and, uh, and the Holocaust was this, you can do a very small definition rather than an expansive definition and move it along and move it to something else. There are a million ways to move around it. The only thing I did just want to mention is that I think often as parents, um, and this may be me projecting, but I think often as parents, we want to we want to make sure our kids feel better or feel okay about the world. And sometimes we can't do that, right? We live in a scary world and we know that. So sometimes it's worth just remembering that this term that psychologists use or that counselors use that I really like is, is just to hold space, which is to say, it's okay when our kids have hard moments, hard spaces, hard questions that we may or may not be able to answer. And it's okay when we can't make them feel better. It's okay to have those moments of just holding space for the emotional life to, to transpire, to, ha to be. And that in the very act of holding space, we hold our kids and keep them safe. So, um, so I thought we would have more time. I hate to end, I hate to, I hate to keep people over time because I used to be a school principal and a school teacher. And so like, I get to the bell and I feel like, oh, you people have young kids. You shouldn't be, uh, you know, you shouldn't be staying up. So I was going to say, if you, if we wanted to in pairs, you could practice what you would say to your kids, but I sort of feel like it's, it's, it's 8, 10. 8, 10. we have a lot of questions too in the, in the, Wait. in the bar. Right. So maybe throw that, um, I, I want to thank everyone. Feel free if you need to get off to do run bedtime or something. We understand. Um, Simone, can we send this? Um, what, can we share the slideshow with uh, participants? Absolutely, of course, a hundred percent. And I'll just can I just end on one? Um, I'm happy to take questions, but I wanted I the one thing I didn't do, and I knew I might end up without time to do it. I didn't give you a list of like which books I love, but I realized what I could give you is um, the resource I use that I love that vets books. And so if you don't know this resource and you're looking for like kids books on the Holocaust or kids books on racism or kids books on um, the removal of American Indian, if what any topic really, I want you, I want you to know about this resources, resource that's brilliant. It's called the CCBC. It's the, Ch um, the Children's Cooperative Book Collective. And this is their address. And if you go onto their website, you can search for age range, ranges, topics, um, and they will give you the, the um, books that they love. So they will, they'll get, so there's an area called recommended books and you can search for Pull down, if you pull down the menu and don't, don't look for title with the word Holocaust in it, but look for subject Holocaust, you can search by age if you want, um, you know, eight, eight, eight year old books or, or books for seven year olds or picture books or chapter books. And they, they, they basically vet all kids books every year and just uh, keep and recommend the ones that they think are great. And they're fabulous, fabulous, fabulous resources. So I, I, can't I can't recommend them highly enough. It's what they do all year round, they're, they're full time. Um, so it's just a great resource. If you're looking for kids books that you would like, um, they will point you in that direction. And we will definitely share that link with y'all and you'll get a follow-up email with video link with all of this stuff and the slideshow tomorrow. So know that that's on the radar. Um, some people had questions about, um, there is there are, there are lots of questions and I have to go back. Um, there was a wondering about how the teacher was kind of doing a barometer check with students as the program was going on. How much checking in was there? Is it you know in a big class? Can you even do that? What did that look like? Yeah. So you know what's great about that teacher was amazing and um, and that class was pre-pandemic obviously and so the kids were in the same room together and the teacher did a I, I skipped way over what um, this teacher did this teacher had the kids wrote in journals daily um, they had they had small groups where they talked um, 
they wrote in sheets. This, this teacher had a close count, uh, uh, sort of a pulse count on who was feeling what in the course of the, um, uh, of the unit. And, uh, and he had a good sense of like, yeah, so-and-so really gets it and so-and-so doesn't. And, and we have to keep an eye on this one because um, because she's confused, she's very confused by it. And there were a number of English language learners who were still struggling just with English. Um, so, you know, they're always in, in any elementary school room, really any classroom, you'll always have some kids who understand more or less or, or um, take in some, but he was, he was excellent. I, I can't recommend him highly enough. He's since retired, um, but he was great at just at knowing how kids were doing with the um, course, with the unit material. And he had a number of ways of checking it. If you don't, if, are you finished with the slideshow? Because if not, you can change it back to. Oh yeah, to I'm the, done. If you want to stop sharing your screen. Oh yeah, um, sure. That would be great. Just so we can see your lovely face. Um, I think there, there, this is more of a comment, but I think if you want to note, this is a challenge, I think for a lot of, some of the people here are classroom teachers or people who deal as Holocaust educators or as docents in the museum. This question about how you teach groups where there is a single identity, where someone could be the only Jew or the only Muslim, the only black person, and what that means and taking on the burden of that identity um, and how we can be comforting to that person, to the Lilas of that group? Yeah, it's such a great question. And it's so um, powerfully important because sometimes the group dynamic alone minoritizes, right? Like, so if you have one student of color in an all white, in, a, in an otherwise all white classroom, that student sort of un, utterly unfairly comes to represent that group. And so er, we, we as teachers need to do everything in our power not to put that burden on that kid. Um, and to make sure that we're not asking them to represent that group in any way, um, even knowing that they may interact with the material very differently. Um, and so I think what I think any way that you open up uh, empathic um, channels is powerful and meaningful and important. Um, and so, so there are a lot of ways to do that. It's just that you're going to be differentially successful. Um, is that, I don't I don't know if that really gets at it, but um, but I've seen this a lot. I, I can just say in that um, that being a, a single identity in a room full of uh, non identities uh, or non shared identities uh, can be very lonely. Can be a very lonely space. One of the things this teacher did that I really liked um, was um, make sure that the kids in the room understood what their shared identities were across difference. So, um, so in that, even in that first book um, that he read The Terrible Things uh, by Eve Bunting, he had the kids, um, this is a kind of classic elementary um, um, strategy, but he had the kids, it's this game called That's Me, so, you know, you stand, you, you say like, who here has X? Who here has two moms? And the kids who have two moms say, that's me and stand up. Or who here has, is, um, why, you know, you, you, who has red socks on? So you could do deep level things or not deep level things. But these kids had been together for a year, knew each other pretty well. Um, and so at least had some close connections in the room. Um, that might have outweighed, um, that might have outweighed or counterbalanced some of Lila's loneliness, but, but not completely, obviously. She felt lonely in part because of the nature of the material, because it spoke to her in that way. Well, I, I want to thank you so much. I oh. think there's been, there's, there's a lot in the chat. I can, I'll share the chat with you of like people saying that they really appreciate what we've, we've discussed tonight. Um, I, so, you know, this is always one of those things that every time we open up a conversation about the Holocaust, and as a museum educator, my world is so much smaller. I get people for an hour and a half or three maybe, and I have to get them where they're at. And so I love this idea of just, you know, kind of trying to feel out that conversation, but also just to promote to the teachers, where are they beforehand? Because 
it's a challenge. And then as I think about this with my own kids, it's like that constant balance. I have a super sensor who I know the minute that we introduce this, this is going to be the end of the world for her. And the other one who's very um, academic, and this is just something she can take in. And yes. so I, I appreciate that idea that it's finding that balance for the two. Yes. Um, and maybe doing something different with the two, um, because that's yeah. the beauty of home versus school, right? School, we have to make these kind of programmatic decisions with the group in mind and home, and home. we just do our best. <laughs> Parents, I think all of us parents, this has been a whole year in which we've been trying to just do our best. Um, so thank you all so much for coming. Thank you for joining us. We'll be sending you a lot of follow-up stuff. I just want to go ahead and thank our sponsors and partners and uh, presenter, Simone, one more time. So thank you. This would be the point that everyone's clapping in real life. Um, and yes, someone's I'm asking. You. I'm saying I'm really thankful for all of you and just all of you. Trust yourselves as the great parents and educators that you are. There's there's no right answers and doing the best we can is the remarkable thing in complicated times. So again, thanks Sharon and Richard Cantor, Karen uh, and Leonard Loeb, Donor Advice Fund of the Milwaukee Jewish Federation, the Nathan and Esther Peltz Holocaust Education Resource Center, Coalition for Jewish Learning, Milwaukee Jewish Day School and Milwaukee Public Library. Um, Programs like this are possible because of donations from people like you. Thank you so much to all the people who donated in advance. If any of the rest of you would like to, there's a link in the chat. We are open for business. We have tickets on sale at our museum website. Go to Jewish Museum Milwaukee backslash visit. And our hours of operation are 10 to 3.30 Monday through Thursday, 10 to 2.30 on Friday and noon to 3.30 on Sundays. We'd love to see you. Our exhibit right now is a Holocaust exhibit. It is called To Paint Is To Live. And we are thinking about it as an exhibit that's great for middle schoolers and up. It is nothing is particularly graphic in the exhibit. So it is one that you could probably, if you want, you can email me. Kathy will throw my email in the chat and we can talk through some strategies for going through this exhibit if you have questions. Um, we have a couple of programs coming up. This is the part that I speed through. I know you guys are done. But on next Wednesday, we are having a book talk with about um, a new book about Helen Daniels Bader. She is the person who kind of inspired the founding of the Bader Foundation, Bader Philanthropies, that has been such a remarkable um, pillar of philanthropy in Milwaukee. And that's going to be noon on Wednesday. And then a week from that on March 17th, we have a program called The Ghetto Chronicles with historian Sam Cassow. He is a remarkable historian who's done eminent research on the Warsaw Ghetto, the Lodge Ghetto, and he's gonna be exploring Theresienstadt as well. And it's gonna be a really fabulous program. Cassie, I'm sure is throwing all of these links in our chat right now. Um, and if you guys have any questions, I can stick around for a little bit afterwards. Thank you guys and for joining us tonight. Uh, Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you.